Uh, this is Tradecrafter's Toolkit, who's actually important and what's actually to blame. I'd like to give a special thanks to the B-Sides team for giving this opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, this presentation is born from an experience of developing operators and comparing their skills against security products and then relying on people at the end of the day to solve those problems. So let's talk about what brings us here for this one. How many times have you heard something similar to this? That we've invested in the most cutting edge security suite available, now we'll be safer. What do you mean we had a breach? Why didn't the system catch it? Well, I mean, obviously the tools are ineffective if my new hire can't catch and stop everything from day one. Well, NetAppy didn't work, so, um, Guess the site's secure? Hopefully you haven't heard the last one. Too often, uh, tools don't only become a crutch for the analysts and the operators, but they also unjustly receive a lot of blame as to the reason that a team isn't, in a, isn't effective. So why are detections, why are mitigations failing in this age of unprecedented technology? What should we do whenever the exploit just doesn't work on that pen test? In each of these situations, the development of each individual's or the team's overall tradecraft, that's what will determine the success or the failure. So this talk focuses on the importance of developing people and their abilities to create a more efficient and effective crew. We're going to discuss when tool reliance is appropriate and when it's a hindrance. Now, this is not any sort of rebuke on tools or their usage, and no tools will be called out specifically. But this is a discussion on the importance of skilled professionals. So getting into this, uh, what we'll be going over here is we're going to define tradecraft necessities of the industry, as you can see the bullet points here. Now this is intended to apply to blue, red, purple, white, black, gray, beige, defenders, aggressors, developers, professionals in general. We will define tradecraft, so I'm not gonna to spend too much time confusing everyone on all of that. Oh, that would it looks like I have backed up here. Sorry, tech problems always great, right? So I'll also hit on what I'll refer to as necessities of the cybersecurity industry. These are gonna be tools and people. And then from there, we're gonna quickly discuss a few of the challenges that are presented by an overly tool-reliant approach to security. Now, that's gonna help set up the next bit where the value of investing in personal and professional growth and skill development will be highlighted. A fair warning on that, it gets a bit soapboxy. Uh, uh, don't worry, I'll try not to be too preachy. Whole thing we're gonna to top off with kind of a proposed roadmap to success. Now this is merely a suggestion or possibly a starting point. There's no end all be all solution. So let's dive in. So first, who am I? Well, I am Wally, like the robot. Although sometimes I am the walrus. Goo 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 you. Now, so I'm a cyber, I am a calibrator turned cybersecurity specialist. Um, I conduct defensive cyber operations for the United States Air Force. Uh, I have several responsibilities in this role. Some of the most notable of these are cyber threat emulation, cyber readiness, which is to say network and vulnerability mapping and analytics. Uh, conducting training and weapons and tactics, which sounds much fancier than what it is. A lot of documentation. But yeah, enough prattling on about myself. That's not why any of you are actually here. When I say tradecraft, what am I talking about? Most people, when they hear the word, think of spies. And who can blame them? One definition is definitely the techniques and procedures of espionage. But obviously this is not what I mean. 
the definition that I'm leveraging is skill acquired through experience in a trade. Notice that it's not aptitude through training. It's skill through experience. This is critical to understanding what this discussion is about. Training is a key component, and I don't want to discount the value of it. Everyone needs foundational knowledge, but it's experience that is the solidifier of that. Skilled personnel are vital to the success of any venture, and they are the greatest asset available. So when I speak of industry necessities, I'm referencing technology and people. We deal with technology, so we need it, right? I will generally use the word tool to reference software, platforms, technology, scripts, and so forth. Tools are absolutely necessary. As networks grow in scale, complexity, and geographic disparity, the ability to defend, test, or attack everything necessary with just a handful of people and the command line becomes less realistic. At the very least, it becomes less effective. We have to be able to leverage and rely upon the hard work of others. Now, while technology is a necessity, so too are our operators and analysts with solid trade craft. One might even argue that they are more important. Who makes the, who do you think makes the tools? We've all seen through reports of breaches and compromise the impact of failing to make people skilled in the art of security for the sake of making them tool jockeys. So to borrow from an old commander of mine, we don't want to reduce our operators to push button, get banana. A tool jockey only knows how to push the button and then becomes paralyzed or panicked when there is no banana. Or worse, doesn't go grow concerned that the banana stopped appearing. As so long as the button works, everything's fine. You get the banana. What happens when the button doesn't work? How do you get the banana now? Are you even sure the button is giving you as many as it should? Or even as many as it could? This is where you need your skilled operators. These are going to be your people who can fix the tool or get the banana another way, or even double check that you're getting the right bananas in the right amount. So we're going to break up the idea of skilled operators a little bit more here. Uh, so remember how I said the trade craft is skill through experience. Not every skilled operator can do everything. There are a few that can, but they're rare. The skilled analyst takes many forms, some of which I'll present here. And we're going to expand on a couple of the most prominent, those being the three highlighted on screen. Now keep in mind that these are just my interpretations of skill sets and they're in no way definitive or inclusive. So starting off, some of the, your most valuable talent are the tool champions. They use the tool, but they also know how to leverage it more efficiently and more effectively. This is the talent that's able to troubleshoot like lightning and tune out the false results. They set themselves apart from the tool jockey by understanding how the tool does what it does and by being able to do the same thing temporarily when the tool fails, albeit less efficiently. You can trust their setup and re the results that it produces. Often your tool champions are the they that you will tap to train others because you trust their expertise. These individuals, keep their finger on the pulse of capabilities and can provide expert recommendations on what to use to best accomplish your objectives. Your tool champions work hand in hand with what I call the concept adepts. These are your lead hacksaws, your lethal forensicators. This is the gal who reads assembly for fun, the them that develops the new covert channels or the guy who solves a memory forensic CTF challenge via VIM. And that is a true story, by the way. There are also those individuals who can put together a team of complementary skill sets. They can guide them to a 70% solution and save the day. 
this is who's going to get tapped to provide the expertise to build out technological functionality. Your concept adepts, they're gonna be your signature authors. They're gonna be your exploit writers. Now, I need to stress here, you don't have to be an absolute master to be a valuable concept adept. Filling this role requires a solid conceptual understanding and an ability to implement concepts in real world scenarios. Now, no one ever knows everything, right? I can't say that I've heard of anyone knowing everything they need without some sort of outside influence or research. Your training gurus will get your people to where they need to be. This is a skilled and trusted role, and it's vital to any long-term success. These individuals understand not only the technology, but also the people behind and in front of it. This is who's going to be trusted to develop and also deliver solid improvement in the people that you and your team rely on. We'll get to our roadmap of success later on, but who do you, who do you think is a cornerstone of guiding people in the right direction? To speak frankly, this is often one of the most underappreciated roles while also being one of the most vital. So knowing what we're working with, what happens when the overall approach is too, too reliant? Well, the excuses flow like electrons through CAT7. We have too many tools, so our operators aren't able to be effective. The technology doesn't work. The software isn't doing the job I expect. I can't get the data retrieved for analysis. We're suffering from alert fatigue, so we missed that critical event. I couldn't get that Metasploit module to work, so I just didn't test it. So what can be done about this? Well, did you ever look into why you have those tools in the first place? Was that technology even meant to work the way that you're trying to use it? Do you have the right thing for this? Are you sure these are not the droids? I mean, data sets you're looking for? What if you didn't look at everything, but then you just looked at the stuff that mattered? And is Metasploit really the only way to conduct a pen test? So a tool champion could have told you, don't use that tool because you're not gonna get memory information from a NIDS. Your training guru would have taught you, or sure, hope should have taught you, that you should not try to run volatility on a dead disk to retrieve PCAP. A concept adept could have given you a new or a different exploit to get that critical finding that you needed in that pen test. The right script could have easily weeded out some of those known benign alerts from your spreadsheet, which would have allowed your analyst to focus more on the actual anomalous behavior, than the potentially malicious. Focusing too heavily on the toolkit without the complementary refinement of tradecraft introduces a myriad of issues. How much time is wasted in training to learn a new system, even though it does the same job as the tools you already have? Countless man hours being lost as you train entire departments on something different that just does the same thing in a slightly different way. How long does it take to get performance back up to an effective level after introducing a new platform? You've lost the time in the training already, but it doesn't stop there. Every system, every process, it has an accompanying learning curve that still has to be worked through that will slow people down. Your experienced analysts become overworked because the work still needs to be done, but now those tool jockeys don't have the ability to function because you've yanked the crutch out from underneath them. Forcing one or two people to do the work of 20 isn't gonna go well for efficiency, it won't be effective. And even worse is when they're expected to do all of this while they're teaching their peers, overburdening skill is the quick, a very quick way to lose talent. 
now that you have everyone focused on learning each new piece of tech that is constantly being placed or refreshed or augmented, where are your operators gaining the experience that they need to develop that skill? Who's carrying your operations into the future? You can't rely on the same experienced people forever. Humans quit, go on vacation, get fired, retire, get sick, and cease to be able to work for a variety of reasons. The replacements, they have to come from somewhere. So how many non-problems have been solved, quote unquote, by new features? Instead of buying that new AV, maybe you should look at tuning your EDR and your sword to respond to the situations you're worried about. There's always a likelihood that you aren't catching events because events aren't even occurring. Luckily, a skilled team can help you figure that out. How many of those so-called problems or how many actual problems were caused by the new features? If you don't have the knowledgeable people, you're introducing a greater chance for unexpected errors due to technological incompatibility. So what happens when, and I do mean when, the technology fails? If all of your focus was on using the tool and now it's gone, what do you do? Is it just time to pack up and go home? While a malfunction, an error, or a crash can definitely create a work stoppage, it shouldn't be the case every time. Wouldn't it be great if someone was able to continue getting the job done, even if not at the same pace as the tool, but until that functionality comes back, you're still moving forward. And then worst of all, if all you know are the tools and nobody knows the concepts underneath, well, then how do you know that you've found or you've missed bad? How do you know that you've tested the vulnerabilities to which the client is most susceptible? So someone once asked the question, which is worse, false positives or false negatives? Almost universally, the response was false negatives. I can't say universally because there may have been a troll or two trying to spark an argument. But why would so strongly the false negatives come back as the resounding answer? Because missing the bad thing is much less damaging than investigating the benign thing. So you've been trained to ID what someone else calls bad, but this company you're working with or the working company you're working for is forced to use those practices. Legacy systems can sometimes require legacy configurations that newer technology just doesn't understand. With all of this, it's going to be experience more than anything else that really helps discern the malicious anomalies from the benign. So what should you do or what should we do as an industry? Well, invest in personal technical growth. If you run the place, grow your people, they get the job done. If you aren't in management or in leadership, or I'd even say if you are, improve yourself because you also get the job done. Growth can be fostered in a variety of ways. Everyone always thinks about going to training, but that's not the only solution. Creating opportunities for yourself and others is one of the greatest methods of refining your skill set. These opportunities should include, but obviously are not limited to, hands-on experience, leadership opportunities, and even the opportunities to fail. Allowing failure fosters growth. Controlled failure leads to fuzzing. We have an entire section of industry dedicated to breaking, so we have to try and manage risk not let the fear of it paralyze us. The organizational toolkit should include a minimum of numbers, a minimum number of skilled personnel in critical roles. Make sure that the team loadout is postured for success and groom the newer members towards those roles you're going to need long-term. As security specialists, 
you'll find yourself in a variety of unique situations and faced with problems whose solutions are far from obvious. How do I know that my alerts work? Why didn't the IDS catch that? What should I do when that exploit doesn't work? How do we handle a situation technology hasn't been designed to cover? Each of these situations, it's the trade craft inherent in the operator and the team that will ultimately determine the success or failure of the operation. As you build your personal skill set, as you develop your organizational toolkit, you'll find yourself better equipped to tackle the complex issues. Honing your abilities and the abilities of those who work with and for you creates more efficiency, generates more effectiveness, and raises the overall value in both yourself and your crew. This does include creating a greater proficiency with the toolkit. Remember the importance of the tool champion. Now, all of this takes time, and on a personal level, takes commitment. And creating a skilled team or building yourself into the best is a costly endeavor. It takes time, opportunity, and money. Sometimes opportunities must be created. Training and technology oftentimes don't come cheap in this industry. Time is your most valuable asset and there never seems to be enough of it. All of these can seem quite daunting, but there are some things you should ask yourself. What have I gotten out of my previous investments? What will I get out of this investment? How do I actually see returns? Are you investing wisely? You might have gotten a new tool, but does it actually do anything fundamentally different than what you already had? It'd be great if you had someone knowledgeable enough to point that out before spending the money. The bells and whistles on that new server sure are something, aren't they? Does it actually perform any better than the one I already own? Do you still have the expertise on your team to accomplish your goals? If not, you can try to get it back, but it's gonna take time and will prove costly. Did you ever develop the personal expertise to hold your own in your chosen field? If the answer to this is no, you do still have time. It's not too late. You can do it. You save plenty of money overall by buying the software and the hardware instead of sending people to training and conferences. But was it really worth the loss of talent that you've been experiencing? So what reason is there to invest in creating skilled people or building out your own trade craft? Why not just get tools to do things faster or may not even require human interaction? Technology just keeps getting better, so that's where we should focus, right? Well, I'll answer those questions with a question. Is it technology or people that make the tools? You'll find that as you invest the time and the effort into building the trade craft, the return on investment is going to come through. There's nothing like finding the one piece that was needed to complete the puzzle. Speaking with a person who seemed to know it all on an intimidating level when you started and being able to hold an honest technical conversation without getting lost or feeling like you sound like an idiot is super satisfying. And a satisfied team is a productive team. Also consider that the most revered professionals are those accomplished in their craft. Well-developed trade craft provides flexibility in operations that is invaluable. It is the best way for your analysis to be able to adapt and evolve in this ever-changing landscape. Sometimes that vulnerability is not going to have been published yet. There are times where the technology hasn't been developed yet, but these don't need to be impassable barriers to success. Unique problems are going to require unique solutions. And in the realm of cybersecurity, there is no shortage of unique situations. The greater your tradecraft, the more efficient and innovative your solutions can be. The road to success 
is paved with lessons of failure. Don't give up or get discouraged just because you don't get the concept right away. Don't feel that you aren't succeeding because you can't do the job without a particular tool. Allow people the chance to fail forward. Try looking at every challenge as a learning opportunity and teaching others to see it too. A very rough roadmap can be laid out something like this. So we're going to lay down a quick idea of how we might get where we, where we wish to go. This isn't groundbreaking, but hopefully some of you may find it enlightening or inspiring. Most of this is going to be approached from an individualized and a personalized kind of viewpoint. Organizationally and as a community, the biggest thing that we can do is allow and enable this journey in ourselves and in our peers. So we have a starting point, right? And we all have to start somewhere. Somewhere is going to be reliant on learning the operation and learning what matters. During this phase, the junior analyst will be largely, sometimes wholly reliant upon the tools. This stage can be overwhelming and potentially seem oppressively long, but we've all been there and we all make it through. For the leaders out there, remember you were once in this stage yourself. As you find yourself in this phase, pay attention to as many details as you can. Soak it all in. As you have personnel in this stage, feed them those details. Give them the whys, give them the hows. Junior analysts should start to learn what it is the technology that you are leveraging is doing. Do your best to begin learning how it's doing what it does. Compiling and delivering reports can actually be a great method of building this understanding. It can help to highlight what it is the organization and or the customers actually care about. It's also a great opportunity to learn the data that matters and also to provide results to compare your own endeavors to. No junior analyst should ever be afraid of starting to dream up better ways to do things. The junior analyst has a fresh set of eyes, not marred by the that's how we've always done it mentality. Trying things out safely in a sandbox and not on company infrastructure should be encouraged. So as you advance in your career, you find that it's less about the specific software and becomes more about the concepts and the objectives. That EDR definitely makes host analysis simpler, but you've learned how to leverage PowerShell to do the same thing. With experience, we all find ourselves relying less on the technology and instead lev leveraging it to accomplish our goals. The tools are great alone. But what if you bridge their functionality? Then they might become phenomenal. Taking advantage of growth opportunities, such as training, conferences, meetups, and even mistakes. The hands-on experience is the solidifier that creates the trade craft instead of just retained knowledge. This is this progression is where operators truly start to learn how to apply. As analysts advance in their career, you, they'll find that it's less about the specific, uh, sorry, I got completely backed up there. So anyways, all of those solutions that have been dreamt up as a junior analyst, how do they start to get implemented? So I know it says made it, and eventually you'll be able not only to see what needs done, but how to do it and what to use to best succeed. But how do you know you've succeeded? How do you know you've made it? Well, you may never feel that way. We exist in a space that is filled with imposter syndrome. 
because so many of us know that there is so much that we don't know. We can't worry about that. You know so much more than you're giving yourself credit for. Organizationally, success is incredibly subjective. Personally, it's still incredibly subjective, but might be slightly easier to generalize. I can't lay out what success is to everyone, but this proposed roadmap does have some expectations of those who've reached the goal. Providing technical insights into the higher level decision making of whatever organization you're a part of is vital to the continued success of your operations. Start presenting to your peers, even if it's just over beers to a few to a few friends or colleagues, and you never present to a local group or ever at a conference. Share your experiences with others. Help the community move forward. This road stretches further into the horizon than we can possibly see. So it requires the continued development of its travelers. The next generation of skill has to come from somewhere. You may not be teaching their classes, but you should be training them to fill your shoes when you are inevitably gone. Being able to take security concepts and apply them in a real world situation is the greatest skill that you can develop and the greatest asset that you can bring to the table. And so what's the TLDR? You need the tools, you need to know what they do and you need to know how they do what they do. Stop blaming the tools, ignoring the training. Stop blaming the training, ignoring the tools. You need to invest in yourself and you need to invest in your people. And never forget that the most important asset is you. Thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, All right, uh, I guess sound of crickets means all good in the room. So, um, yeah, uh, the contact information on the screen. Any, for any questions, shoot in my way. I will make my slides available to the B-Sides team, however they want that to happen. And thank you very much, everyone. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Logan. We really appreciate it. Uh, the, I, I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, in the GoToWebinar chat. If there are any other uh, questions, um, feel free to post them in the Discord, or you can ask them here. Oh, seems good. All right. Well, thank you, Wally. We really appreciate your your talk. It was very informative and definitely indicative of <laughs> of what I see, you know, in my day to day work as well. That's it sounded very very similar to our to my situation. So, oh, well, thank you very much. And yeah, um, I think regardless of what section of this we fall into, whether it be public, private, red, blue, however you want to look at it, we all kind of stare down the same things going along, right? So, and at the end of the day, we're the ones who get to make the difference. This is true. So. A lot of folks in the uh, Discord are, are saying, thank you, great job, NGL and Boster syndrome is real. <laughs> yeah, way too much suffering from that even on a personal level. Yeah, hey, so, man, I hear, I hear you. <laughs> no, thank all of you, and thank you, thank you so much for giving me the time to, to actually present as well.